Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for registering and joining today for our conversation about lead in New York City soils. Um, I'm Lauren Wilson, Director of Marketing Communications at the New York Restoration Project, and we're super thrilled to be hosting this webinar today um, with a couple of, you know, local experts on the topic who I think can answer a lot of questions and concerns that if you're a gardener or, you know, have have something you've been growing in New York, you these are these these women are great resources to go to. Um, also, our team at New York Restoration Project is always happy to receive any questions you might have and try to answer them to the best of our ability. Um, you can uh, email info at nyrp.org. Um, there's also, I think, an email associated with this webinar, which I think is mine, but you can shoot me a message as well. Um, so I don't want to waste any time here. I think Sarah, uh, Pearl, excuse me, I see your full name there. Dr. Sarah Pearl Eggendorf is ready um, to present. She's going to go for about 45 minutes. Um, and then um, Aishima Harris from East New York Farms is going to tell us a bit about her work related um, to Pearl's work as well um, in distributing clean soil and what it's been like on the ground um, for a few minutes after Pearl's presentation. Um, we're going to be taking questions throughout, so please use the Q&A function um, in this Zoom platform in order to submit your question. You don't, you don't have to wait until the Q&A portion. You can submit it at any time. Um, and then once um, Aishima's given her response to, to Pearl's presentation, we'll we'll go to those. But um, without further ado, um, Pearl, talk to us about lead and soil. Thank you so much, Lauren and Jason and everyone with NYRP. It's really my pleasure to be here and um, to talk to you today about how we can mitigate or limit lead's legacy in New York City soils. So this is what I've been studying for my PhD, which I just completed, and really happy to share what I've learned with you and some of the work that we're doing. So today I'm going to start with some acknowledgements, give you an overview of lead in urban soil, show you a map of New York City, maps of other cities documenting that this is really an environmental injustice. We'll talk about lead versus other contaminants, ongoing sources of exposure, and a lot of the complexities, why this is a tricky issue and why there may even sometimes be some disagreement with scientists. This information can be confusing because it's complex. We're going to try to simplify it today. And then we're going to talk about what we can do about it. Uh, what we can do about lead in soil. The best practices are always crucial. We'll talk about those. Talk about some of the misconceptions about what you can do. And really why the best thing you can do is replace or cover contaminated soil with new clean soil. So to do that, we've been constructing soil in New York City. I'll talk about these interventions that we're making at different scales of time and space. Talk about the Carbon Sponge and Just Soil Project and then really emphasize the East New York Farms Healthy Soil Initiative, which Ayashima will talk about, and then how we can keep connecting across time and space. So without further ado, I was born and raised in Lenape Hoking, unceded land of the Lenape people. And I think it's important to always acknowledge, no matter where we are, which indigenous lands we're on. So I begin this presentation by acknowledging that we're in Lenape Hoking, Lenape homeland, acknowledging the Lenape community, Lenape elders of past and present, and their future generations to come. Many of the institutions that we are part of, certainly the ones that I'm a part of, uh, were founded on exclusions and erasures of indigenous peoples. And so I invite all of us to commit to the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism in all education and research endeavors. So we seek to do that in this work and put that at the forefront. In addition to indigenous land acknowledgement, I always have to thank all of the essential urban growers, urban and non-urban growers, the people who cultivate our soil every day, especially in our cities, are leading, are driving urban sustainability and environmental justice. So community gardens are right there, urban farms, everyone cultivating the soil, I thank you. Uh, we thank you because you are doing this work to support community and environmental wellness by providing access to fresh produce, food sovereignty, physical activity for participants, space for community building and cultural exchange, the use of abandoned lands, reduced waste, and improved air and water quality, and many ecosystem services. So we always need to name this, but who are the people leading this now and always have been Black people, Black, Brown, Latinx, Indigenous, Asian people throughout the diaspora, Black Lives Matter for so many reasons, but cannot be undervalued here. So just need to start with that. 
and who am I representing? So I mentioned already that I just finished my, I finished a master's of science and a PhD, and a PhD at CUNY. I am such a fan of the CUNY system. Um, so talk to me if you have any questions about it. So I just finished that. And then during that process, I helped to organize this legacy led consortium or coalition trying to get 20 plus different organizations on the same page about how we deal with lead. So right now we're mostly just a listserv, but I'm curious to see what new iterations take shape. And then for the next two years, I'll be a postdoctoral researcher with Cornell, but I'll still be based in the city doing this work. So I'm mentioning all this to stay in touch. We're always looking to bring more people into this work. Um, and I'll be around doing it for at least the next two years and hopefully the foreseeable future. Um, well, so with that being said, let's talk about lead. Lead and soil. Um, this is a map that you see here of uh, zip code areas in New York City and every area in red has a median value, that's one of the average values, above 400 parts per million. If the median value is between 150 and 399, it's yellow. Green is one to 149 and then no data is on the blank areas. And what this means is that the EPA sets this soil screening level at 400 parts per million. Our New York State Department of Environmental Conservation uses that same 400 parts per million, although many, many people who I listen to and respect say that this safety threshold should be much lower. Uh, ideally, right, this green area 150 or below, 100 or below. Nonetheless, this is not a systematic map, but we see high lead in our city soils and we see this everywhere. Lead is here. Uh, fun fact I love to say is that even 36% of our fine city's surface is covered with soil. There is soil in our cities. This does of course include Staten Island and the outer boroughs, but it's here. Um, and it, right, as I said, this isn't a systematic map, but it's very common to have lead in urban soils. We'll talk more about what lead really is. It's an element that can't be broken down or removed from soil. And this puts people at risk. It's not just gardeners, it's all residents, especially kids. But it's the gardeners who've been building new soil, greening our cities and limiting this exposure for generations. So I'm here to help contribute, um, share this knowledge so that we can keep working together and continue to limit exposure. And this is not surprisingly an environmental injustice. So here you see maps put together from Oakland, California. And right, the same thing with many environmental issues, low income communities and communities of color are at risk for an exposure. So this is, these are these historical ongoing inequities that we need to address with this and so many other issues. So here what we see is high soil lead, as you see greater than 400 parts per million um, in these high red areas. At, so there's high lead and we see that correlating with communities of color. So the darker areas are lower populations of white people. So we see it correlated with communities of color, high rates of poverty and elevated blood lead levels. So all of these factors come together and these unjust patterns occur in many different places and they must not continue. We can do better. We're working on it. So we talk a lot about lead, but I just want to be clear that there's many different contaminants in soil. There's many different sources, many different types of contaminants. So lead is important, but it's not the only issue. And so, you know, we need to be aware of these complexities, but for the most part, it's actually relatively easy and simple to test for lead. So I'll just say this now, you can send soil samples to the Brooklyn College Urban Soils Lab. They're currently closed with the pandemic, but they'll reopen as soon as they can. And lead, you can do a quick screen to get you know, levels of lead, even other metals like zinc, arsenic, chromium, and copper. But all of all these things like this, PAHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, um, these are organic contaminants, meaning they're molecules built from um, you know, carbon and hydrogen, and they can be very expensive to test for, much harder. So that's where we can assume if there's lead there, you may have these other contaminants, you know to deal with your contamination issue. But, we've made a whole incredible cocktail of wild chemicals and compounds that we've put in our soils and the soils absorb them hold on to them and so it's our job now to limit our exposure to that and so we talk about these historical sources that we've done all these you know industrial activities in the past but thank goodness we banned lead from paint well a lot of the leaded paint is still on buildings, even and especially building exteriors and infrastructure. Um, the histories of leaded gasoline have landed in soil. So 
especially as that paint deteriorates by power sanding or scraping, that lead can enter the soil. And from leaded gasoline, we've released four to five million tons of lead in the US environment. So that the soils hold that reservoir, it's still in them. We've seen that soil lead can be proportional to highway traffic flow. And what you see in this image here, or here you see January uh, to January, you see the winter months and then the summer months. And what you see is soil in the air and lead in the air, and they fluctuate together. We see a lot more lead in the air. We see a lot more soil in the air in the summer months where it's dry and dusty um, where versus the winter months when it's kept down. So this dust can then, as it's resuspended in the summer, can then be distributed around a city, and this is an ongoing source of exposure. And then what we also see is the same pattern, where here you see particulate matter 2.5, that's a way we measure dust. We see this still winter low, summer high dust in the atmosphere, and this is blood lead levels for infants. Um, this was actually in Milwaukee, but we see these patterns in many different places. It's actually slightly lagging behind the dust in the atmosphere. So we see that blood lead level fluctuates with these patterns. Um, so this dust is a source of human exposure that we cannot ignore and that we can do something about. But it's also complicated. So I'm showing you this slide, which is trying to simplify some complications. And I recognize that it's still a complicated slide. But what I've done here has been as taking um, here you see the sinks. This is the places in soil where lead can be stored. So we've got solid phases. These are the actual minerals in soil. You want to talk about soil mineralogy. It is fascinating. Rocks are broken down. These minerals make up the bulk of our soils. And so lead can actually be part of those mineral structures that like sort of held on to them, um, sort of in the structures. And so here you see lead can be in a solid phase but it can also move through solution. It can just be on the surface of a particle. It can also be um, connected to soil organic matter and all of the microbes in soil, the billions and billions of organisms who make soil what it is, its living form. So lead can be attached to them. And then it can also be absorbed by roots or it can be held to root surfaces. So these are the places in which the soil, the lead can be found, but there's all of these processes that determine where the lead is. So in order for it to go from the solid phase all the way to a plant root, first and foremost it has to be desorbed from the solid phase, removed from that solid, enter solution. Then it can move, move by convection, move through the soil water, um, but generally after it does that it sorbs or holds on to a new binding site like these microbes. And, but again, only if it's in solution will it be absorbed by the roots. That's how roots take up their nutrients. They take up those nutrients as they float around in the soil water. So there's all of these processes going on and it's dynamic. That's why I put these arrows going both ways. It's hard to know exactly what is going to occur when. It's always ongoing. But not only are there these sinks, these forms of lead, these processes determining this, but there's all these properties of soil that we can measure that determine what's going on. So here you see cation exchange capacity. That really represents the soil's ability to hold on to nutrients. We've got cation exchange capacity, clay minerals, carbonates, iron and manganese oxides, phosphates, and soil organic matter. In general, when you have high quantities of all of these properties, high content, you're gonna have low mobility or you're gonna be more likely to find lead in its solid phase, which is less risky. So we like for you to have lots of organic matter in the soil, um, right, good cation exchange capacity, all of these properties will make the lead less of a risk. Um, if there's low, quantities of all of these soil constituents, you're more likely to have higher mobility and the lead is more likely to move towards roots. pH is this master variable in soils and near neutral pH keeps lead in this low, mobil low mobility zone. If the pH gets too high or too low, too alkaline or too acidic, you're more likely to have it move into solution and be taken up by roots. So it's very hard to determine what's exactly happening, but we know that all of these play a role. So I want to show you that for some of that uh, science uh, broken down. So that's really what's going on. So what do we do about it? No matter what, whether or not you've got high carbonates or, you know, or, you know, any of these other properties or you don't know what processes are going on, using these best practices is really one of the best things you can do 
they're common sense, but these 10 best practices, practices put together by Cornell were all based by research and clear observation. So I highly recommend going to their website, getting more information on this. Uh, and number one, use clean soil and compost. Use raised beds. Avoid treated wood. Cover or mulch your soil. I can't stress mulching enough because I've done this research, which I'm not showing here, will hopefully be published soon, you'll see, but that you can grow crops in contaminated soil, but when you use mulch, you limit the splash or some of that contaminated soil getting onto the crop surfaces. And it can be safe for consumption. So we don't want you growing in contaminated soil, but if you have any, Contaminants in your soil, use some mulch to limit that splash. It is so crucial. Um, again, near neutral pH, we talked about why that keeps lead less mobile and good for most plants anyway, most, not all. Um, putting a barrier under children's play areas, keeping an eye on children who are most at risk, leaving that soil in the garden, cleaning yourself off before you go home, washing hands, which clearly we do now all the time, and then washing and peeling produce. So very common sense, but I can't stress these enough should always use them. But in addition to these best practices, there's more we can do. And so we can, ho uh, we can share signs. There's a lot of these signs available. So please email me if you're interested in one. They actually have been printed in blue with the New York City logo on it. Um, there's a ton available. So let me know if you'd like one. This was sort of broken down by this legacy led um, consortium where we took all those big ideas on the 10 best practices and condensed them here. And they're metal signs, they're quite attractive. So let me know if you want one. Okay, but then there's all these other questions, things you can do. Now, I always get this when I can't see the participants. I don't know who's nodding yes or who's gonna nod off as I'm rambling on at you, but basically I get this question all the time. Can you remove lead from soil? And can plants help us do this? AKA phyto extraction or phytoremediation. I, I can't see a show of hands, but most people are like, yeah, yeah, I heard you can do that. I heard you can plant sunflowers and it'll magically suck up your lead. Um, it's not true. Sorry, everybody. Not true. Um, sunflowers are, are wonderful. We love sunflowers, um, but they don't suck up your lead. And there was some research done in the 90s that showed that if you add chelating agents, something in the soil that makes it more mobile, Sunflowers and many other plants can take up more lead than they would otherwise. Um, but guess what happens when you make that lead more mobile in the soil water? It can also leach out into groundwater and you're making a huge issue of what really should be kept in place. So plant sunflowers don't think it's removing your lead. Uh, this is good news because most crops are usually safe. They usually don't take up lead from the roots. Dust is the issue we tend to see most of. So Anyway, phyto extraction for lead doesn't work, although it may work for other elements and many plants can break down those organic contaminants. So more on that topic later, if you, if you want to talk about it. Another question I get is, can you add amendments to soil to make the lead less toxic or less bioavailable? So one common amendment people add is compost or phosphorus, fish bones. It's a common practice um, and a great practice. Adding compost when not, when not adding too much is a wonderful thing to do for your soil. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily make the lead less toxic. Okay, so there's a lot of uncertainty about that. Different testing methods are used. If you add phosphorus, which is often in compost, it can make arsenic more available, even if it makes the lead less available. Um, so it's a great practice, but don't think you're dealing with your lead issue. Okay, so can you just dig it up and remove it? Absolutely, if money is not an issue. Uh, so these contaminated ball fields in Red Hook are requiring a hundred million dollars to remediate. A lot of that will be removing the soil. Um, so yeah, if you have if money is no issue, you can remove your soil. But I listen to a lot of people who say you can cover it. And so here's a project in New Orleans led by um, who we call our godfather of lead and soil, Dr. Howard Milkey, and that. He uses a landscape fabric so you know, don't go beneath that landscape fabric and then bring in new soil to cover it and you've eliminated exposure. As long as that cover's maintained, maintained, people are safe. And that's the goal here. So capping and covering, bringing in new soil or replacing, this is really uh, one of the best things we can do. The question is then, where do you get new soil? So that brings us to the New York City Clean Soil Bank. 
constructing soil. So this, the first pilot study began in the fall of 2014, and this was led by the Mayor's Office of Environmental Remediation, and they oversee many different development sites. And what they found, especially in Brooklyn and Queens, is that as, you know, they do these all thorough, thorough testing of these sites, they dig these uh, deep cores, drill down a core, they test the materials at these different levels and they found that often there's contaminants at the surface, which we find everywhere. But when you go below the surface, those sediments in Brooklyn and Queens, I should say this again, sediments are broken down pieces of rock, whereas Manhattan and the Bronx are mostly solid bedrock. A lot of Brooklyn, Queens and all of Long Island has these uh, sediments left by glaciers at their surface. So they found that all these sediments were so clean and they were being taken far outside of the city, potentially put in landfills. And they're saying, can't we do something with this? So they used it to help build Brooklyn Bridge Park, for example, and many other um, you know, restoration and resiliency projects in New York City, but they want to know if it could be used as a growing medium. So we got sediments from OER that have been thoroughly tested. We know they're clean. We mix it with compost from the Guamas Canal Conservancy made from food scraps brought it to community gardens in Brooklyn. One was East New York Farms. And then we did a study testing these soils, growing crops, seeing what we found. And here are the beds at East New York, Farm, East New York Farms. And we found that they create a viable growing medium. And these soil parameters, the way we analyze the pH, organic matter, everything else, we found that they're suitable for edible crops. We found that at least 33% compost by volume was adequate for yield, um, which we compared to a topsoil that was provided by Green Thumbs. The crops were not contaminated, even when we did this in one garden with surrounding contaminants. So uh, they were safe for consumption. Soil metal concentrations were low, but we uh, had kept monitoring at a number of the sites. But what we found three years later, these are pictures of them three years later, and um, some of these beds have been removed. So we're on the next generation. Um, but what you see here is that they don't yet look like naturally occurring soils. They support plant growth, they're fully productive, but naturally occurring soils take thousands of years to form. So we have all of these great, exciting science questions like what biological, chemical, and physical processes are going on in these newly constructed soils. What's going on over time and what's going on in different spaces? How are they functioning? And one of the big questions we have is how much carbon is being sequestered or stored in these soils? because um, they start out with very low organic matter, how much can build up over time, and how can we optimize these conditions? So these are the questions that I'm gonna keep asking as a researcher, and again, I welcome any and everyone to join in and contribute to this project in any way you see fit, because there's, a lot, there's many more questions that can be asked, and we won't answer them with one study, right? Well, we need many, many more studies to try to, to, try to understand what's really going on. So the way I've been seeing this operate is that we have different scales of these interventions to create clean soil. And I think about the micro scale, what's happening, at very small scale, what's meso, a little bigger, and then macro over time and space. And I'm thinking about these biogeochemical, that's like this physical chemical, you know, certain kinds of scientific questions going on. And then I'm also thinking about social questions and how this is all relating. So on the biogeochemical scale, we're constructing these new soil mixtures on small scales in different places. On the meso scale, we're evaluating this soil development over time with multiple different producers. And on the macro scale, we're gonna keep looking at how, we're, how many different places have new soils, how we're quantifying these new soil exchanges, how we're covering contaminants and storing carbon over time and space. But socially, this research really lends itself well to participatory research, co-creating this new knowledge with people who are directly impacted by environmental injustice, as we've already spoken. So the Just Soil Project focuses on two NYCHA communities, um, and the Carbon Sponge Project is really looking at this carbon sequestration potential. But we're co-constructing this research with people with expertise outside of, academ outside of academia, because the more you're inside academia, as I can now vouch, you kind of, it's very easy to lose touch with the real world. You get caught in some really complicated terms. You need to be grounded. So it, the research is better when we're doing it in partnership. Um, but then over time, we're studying this infrastructure development with different city agencies, like the Mayor's Office of Environmental Remediation, Department of Sanitation, Parks Department. So we are doing that through the Legacy Lead Network and this East New York uh, Healthy Soils Initiative is really connecting all of these different pieces, distributing this soil on a broader scale. And on the large scale, 
in the long term because we're facing budget crises right now. We've got a lot going on, but on the large, on the long term, we need to have policies around this, and we're we're paving the way forward. Um, we need to have more infrastructure and funding for a self-sustaining soil distribution and education system in New York City and beyond. And in some really exciting news, OER has been working since 2013 to have their own site to stockpile these sediments, and it's going to open in August. So the city, the city is funding this. This is moving forward. So we need everybody joining in and expanding it. So with that, I'm gonna show you some photos of these sites, show you what it looks like. Here's pictures from the Carbon Sponge Project. This is led by an artist named Brooke Singer, and she's involved many different people to join in. She's got a great website, carbonsponge.org. And here's the sediments that were dug up from a construction site. Again, thoroughly tested, we know they're clean. We dig up these sands, essentially, bring them in a huge truck, dump them to the site, and then we mix them with compost by hand in wheelbarrows, put them in the beds. Um, grow different crops. And here we really focus on different planting combinations, but here are the beds, highly productive. This was the first uh, growing season at the New York Hall of Science. They've now expanded to other sites, including Pioneer Works in Brooklyn. And here's images from our Just Soil project, um, which was, this was initially based at Nitro Ravenswood in Long Island City. And so here we're called it the Raves Garden. We're constructing soil for environmental and social justice from these sediments, from compost created by, um, the New York City Compost Project hosted by Big Reuse, which we hope will return to full capacity as soon as possible. Um, this composting has been cut with the budget crisis right now. Uh, but also this is done with researchers from CUNY, with youth from the Jacob Reese uh, Neighborhood Settlement House, and with community members from Nitro Ravenswood. So here we are building the beds. We almost, we tried to make hexagonal beds like our sister project Carbon Sponge, but it was maybe a little too much effort for us. So we built, Rombai, we got the sediments, we loaded them in wheelbarrows. Um, we put, we didn't have landscape fabric, but we used a layer of sediments as that cap so we can core over time and see how the soils change with layers. The compost is light enough for kids to pick up and mix it in with sediments and then put it in the beds. And then here we did different ratios of compost, planted all the same crops in each bed, um, had a really productive growing season. We measure the yield have fun at a cookout. And then we've been engaging young people there to really co-construct these research questions and materials. Um, so here's some youth at Nitro Ravenswood that we've been working with, engaging mind and body, you know, in all aspects. And then here's some of the youth we worked with at the lab at Brooklyn College. Sorry, this is the lab at the Advanced Science Research Center at CUNY. And then finally, we've got the East New York Healthy Soils Initiative and this distribution network that was really this dream. Okay, it's great to mix these soils in one site, but people need access. This has to be available on a larger scale and distributed out. And so East New York Farms is the first organization to really make this possible. And so they got a grant from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, have worked very closely with Mayor's Office of Environmental Remediation, Department of Sanitation, and us researchers with CUNY. And so here's this site at the Wortman Community Garden when it was first being built. They capped the whole site with sediments, did layers of landscape fabric and mulch, um, built all of these beds for community gardens. And you see on the right here, is, this is where um, the big deliveries of sediments and compost can be made and mixed, picked up. Ayashima will talk about all of this. But then they hired people from the plant station to get a sifter, to mix the materials. It saved a lot of physical labor then to do that, have people you know, use the equipment. And then here's one delivery. This was delivered to um, 15 community gardens and then many other people came and picked it up in the first growing season. Here's our research beds on site. And here's a recent picture from this year, the beginning of the second growing season. And here's some of the soils that people have recently been picking up. We also provided soil testing. So if you have more questions about how to test for lead and other contaminants, we're providing that through East New York Farms right now. Here's pictures of last year's soil pickup. Um, and then I'll just say, so that's all about East New York Farms. And I'll just say again, to keep expanding this out. This is on that small and meso scale, making these soils available. But we've sort of been asking how we can keep getting people on the same page. So with the Legacy Lead Coalition, we started meeting in 2016, 20 plus organizations, really looking to develop our understanding and education around soil lead. So we've connected with a lot of garden education networks, revamped these best practices, made um, a story about lead, 
we've done, they, this network helped facilitate all of these follow-up projects, all these different organizations have been involved in this network, and then ideally laid the groundwork for the soil distribution we now see occurring. And then even beyond that, beyond our own city, here's a map showing areas in the U.S. that have been mapped for soil lead. So hundreds of regions throughout the U.S. and the world have documented that there's lead in soils. But in a comprehensive review paper published in 2017, only 23 uh, studies documented these interventions covering contaminated soil. So we know there's many more interventions going on. And so my question is how we can keep highlighting this and um, building upon it. So I think we need local partnerships as we're developing in New York City with you know, organizations, growers, soil stewards. I think we can keep using the resources within academia to support this. Um, but we need to strengthen these local connections and build them more broadly throughout this country and throughout the world. So in summary, I want to know how we can keep centering the needs um, and interests of affected communities to systematically reduce exposure to lead in soil. And so on the small scales of time and space, we keep using these sediments and composts following best practices and building new soil. On this mesoscale, we need to keep sharing this knowledge, um, building our networks. And on the broader scale, I think we keep building on interagency collaborations, new policies, and I think we might be able to use New York City as a model city for this. So I also wanna know how we can work together. And for those of you who are interested in the PowerPoint, I've got a ton of re references here, and feel free to stay in touch. Here's my email. Great, thank you, Pearl. Um, and if I, I remember in uh, when we've done these webinars previously, people have asked if your slides might be available after. Would you be willing to make these for us? Okay, for us to send them out. Absolutely. Great. Um, so, Aishima, I will. We've, we're a little ahead of schedule, which is great. Um, and we've got some questions coming in, and just to remind everyone, I'm saving all of those for after Aishima's response to what Pearl um, just presented on. But if you continue to have questions, put them there, and then we'll start answering them um, once Aishima is done presenting. But um, Aishima, I'll let you get your slides up, and we'll make the transition here. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Aishima Harris, and I'm the project director for East New York Farms. Uh, so Pearl gave a brief overview of our project, and I just want to um, share with everyone what we're doing and how we've been helping community gardeners in East New York, and now with the pandemic outside of East New York. Okay. Oh, sorry. My screen is acting up. Okay. So East New York Farm's mission is to organize youth and adults to address food justice in our community and to promote local sustainable agriculture in a community-led development. Um, some of our programs of East New York Farms, we do have a youth internship program. We hire about 37 to 40 interns each year. Um, this year, due to COVID, we were able to hire 22 returning interns. Those are youth who have been through the program. It's a nine-month internship program, and we do pay them a stipend, and we do get to build with them on a larger scale, and they do help us out with every single um, program that we have in East New York Farms. This is a UCC youth farm. This is where the first testing that Pearl mentioned for the clean soil research started. And at this farm, um, this is where our farmer's market was derived out of in 1998. Then we have the Pink Houses Community Farm where we have a weekly food distribution. So we do have a fresh fruit pantry where we have NYCHA resident come twice per week and pick up food from our site. UCC Fresh Room is also um, one of our local gardens in a neighborhood where youth interns and their family could grow food. And the Wartman Community Garden, this is our baby turn one year now, Pearl, I believe. Um, I wish I had before and after photos just to show everyone what the Wartman Community, how far this garden have um, gotten. So the Wartman Community Garden is where we've done most of our clean soil research. These are the garden beds that Pearl mentioned earlier. 
Um, so community gardeners, we provide them with the clean soil. They do whatever they want to do with it. We don't tell them how to use it. Um, we don't show them how to use it. We're like, here's the soil. Um, let's see what comes out of it. So we've been um, keeping track of that um, intentionally just to see how people have been using their soil at the Wartman Community Garden. But our tests and beds, which is right here in the front, we try to keep that as pure as possible so we do not add anything to it. And this is what the clean soil looked like. This was a delivery last year to a local community garden. Some takeaway from this project is that the project started in 2014 at East New York Farms. Um, we're able to provide access to clean soil um, to community gardens that are contaminated. Uh, the soil composition is 50-50 ratio of compost and sediment. This year, we gave out 40,000 pounds of clean soil. So a couple weeks ago, Pearl and I had a clean soil distribution. We had over 50 people showed up. Um, each person received about five bags max. Um, Pearl and I literally pre-bagged about 250 bags and people show up and they ask for more. So we allowed for them to bag their own soil. Um, each year we assist about 80 community garden members by serving them with clean soil. We do receive our compost from DSNY. This year we did a unique research. I'm really fascinated about clean soil and all that Pearl is doing with this project. So a lot of times I tend to bounce my ideas off of her. So this year we got compost from DSNY and the Lower East Side Ecology Center. Um, we mixed two separate piles just to see how the compost will, will react to the soil and, um, and just to see like how the plants will grow. So this year, uh, we able to see that, and Pearl and I are still fascinated by the results. I'm not sure if she wanna share some of that. Um, in regards to that, we also reach out to community gardeners just to get some feedback from them and collect some data on how they use the soil what experience they have with the soil and what um, kind of crops they grow in the soil. So we do make sure that we follow up with a lot of testing questions just to receive their feedback. And I believe, yeah, and I believe that's everything I would like to share on this call. That's great, thank you, Aishima. Um, and, and we have some questions um, that, you know, we'll let you both kind of decide how to best answer. Um, and we also, in case anyone can see, we also have Jason Smith, who is our director of Northern Manhattan Parks from uh, New York Restoration Project, in case anyone has a question that pertains, you know, to our work in this way and this in, for this subject. Um, so to get started with questions, um, is it all right with you, Ashima and, and Pearl, if I read them off to you and then we can talk that way? Okay. Um, so the first one we have here, and I want to read this correctly, so just... Bear with me. Um, DSNY just cut the compost project. The compost project is where the majority of community gardeners got their compost to help with lead mobility concerns. And that's a question. So I think they're asking if the compost project was the, where the majority of community gardeners got the compost to help with lead mobility. Yes or no? Yes. And okay. it was a real disappointment a heartbreak that the compost projects, um, sorry, DSNY has funded seven different sites that create compost on a pretty large scale. And they've all lost funding due to the pandemic and budget cuts. So um, it's really upsetting because all of these organizations have done tremendous work for decades to make compost available in our cities. Um, so right, people could get free compost every year. That's no longer uh, being given. I talk with a lot of researchers who are convinced that it'll just, it'll reinstate in 2021, we'll be fine. This is just a little dip and a lull. Um, I like that long-term perspective, but there's been a lot of petitions going on. There's city council people working to create mandatory composting in the city. So I think we need to keep calling. I've been doing a lot of this, calling and pushing our, our legislators to um, reinstate composting immediately. This shouldn't be cut. We need environmental green jobs now. So yeah, this will be, this um, will be yeah, go ahead. 
Oh, I was just going to say, I think there's a bunch of questions about this issue. Um, and I was wondering if, if both of you could maybe speak briefly to how you see next season happening without the compost project and, and what that means for your work. Definitely. Um, so it's funny when I, when I mentioned that OER just got this huge site also in East New York to bring the sediments, for the clean soil um, from construction sites. And this is tremendous news, many, many years in the making. And I said, well, have you thought about the compost issue? <laughs> and it's not, it's unresolved. I mean, there are many different sites that create compost on smaller scales. East New York Farms is doing that. They were never one of the compost project DSNY funded sites, but they've been making compost for years. BK Rot makes a lot of compost. Reclaimed Organics, Common Ground Composting is doing this. A lot of different community gardens. So in the meantime, I think a lot of us just need to have our own small scale composts until it can be picked up again on a larger scale. Um, yeah, I will second that with Pearl. Um, for East New York Farms, our, we do collect food scraps from the community. We, we, don't, we, we haven't stopped um, since DSNY shut down. So a lot of people have been using our site a lot and we're receiving tons of food scraps on a weekly basis. Uh, our site is not as large where we could produce the same amount of um, compost that DSN, DSNY would. However, if we have gardeners who drop by and ask if we have compost, we do have a few, we do have like some sitting on site where it could be like, yeah, do you want to bag it yourself? Here's the supplies, here's the resources. You could take home however much you need. Mm -hmm. um, so it's by a case to case basis for us. If you call and we have it, we will give it to you. We're not gonna say no. Um, we understand, we're here for the community. We're here for community gardeners and we understand that it's a hard time that they're facing right now. So we're trying to make sure that we have access as much as possible. I just wanna say that Eastern Farms at their main site with the UCC, the you know, community center, um, you've got your bin out there all the time. So it's really amazing, it's an amazing resource. If you've got food scraps like many of us do and we're used to taking them to the farmer's market, I've been dropping them out there. Yeah, that's great to know. Um, yeah. The next so question, of, oh, what's It sort of addresses the question, what are the priority areas for implementing the soil compost project? We need to reinstate the compost projects. Um, so again, I'm saying look online, we can probably share if you want. Um, the links for the petitions and info with which to contact your city council people because it's really important to push for that. Yeah. Do you and and it seems like if Alyssa is the same person who's asking questions here, do you want to answer those follow up questions she left too? Um, if it's the same person, um, she asked or Alyssa asked, um, are there permitting requirements? Are there runoff considerations? So um, two things. I mean. There have been um, some considerations, for example, there's no official permitting requirement for this, but to get a big delivery of sediments from OER, you have to be able to receive 20 cubic yards. That's the smallest amount you can get. So you need a really large site. So that's why the Wartman Community Center, sorry, Wartman Community Garden is really large, can handle a big delivery, and then people can pick up smaller amounts. Um, if you're a green thumb garden, it's really good to make sure that your outreach coordinator is on board and knows what you're doing because um, we want to be in full communication. So it might be the same with NYRP, but I haven't heard of that. I mean, if you if you have a if you have a home garden, you can bring in whatever you want. If you've got a community garden, you're generally able to do that too. But East New York Farms is not currently making those deliveries to green thumb gardens. Um, that's green thumb's job. But if you want to pick some up, you can do that. So. Just good to be aware of who's helping to manage your site and being in communication about it. Yeah. Do you have something to add to that? Aishima, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Okay. Um, as for the runoff considerations, that's a great question and is going to be the topic of some of our follow up research because, okay, so runoff or especially leaching, if you have a lot of organic matter in soils, some of this nitrogen and phosphorus can move through the soil water, enter groundwater, causing eutrophication, um, and a lot of the issues we're seeing in Jamaica Bay with algae blooms and, and um, 
uh, can really kill off a lot of aquatic life. So this is a huge issue and why, one of the main reasons why it's important to limit how much compost you add to your soils every year. There's rules about that. Other states have even more strict rules than New York, but um, so some of those nutrients, these runoff issues can occur. Um, we haven't done any studies to collect what we call the leachate, what moves through the soil, but that's gonna be one of our follow-up projects to do that. Again, we're using, a lot of gardeners use a lot of compost in their beds. Some use 100% compost. Um, so these are some unknown questions we're looking to answer. So if you have questions about that and want to do your own experiment, I highly encourage you to do so. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's an unknown right now. But one of the reasons why we've been trying to use less compost, not more. Got it. Um, so we have a question. I heard planting cilantro naturally cleanses heavy metals from soil. Is that effective slash true? So if you remember my slide on phyto extraction, that's what this question is about. Can you plant this plant and it'll suck it up? It'll just clean it up. Um, cilantro can take up some, we see a lot of the leafy greens. They, they have potential for a lot of, there's some uptake that can occur. Mustard families, right? Uh, brassicas, they can take up some lead. So, if you have high lead in your soil and you're planting cilantro, you might not want to eat that. I would recommend not eating that. Those plants are not able to take up so much lead though that it's actually going to remove it from a highly contaminated soil. You would need many, many, many successive croppings. Some estimates say a couple hundred years to remove the lead. And in the meantime, then you're planting for a couple hundred years, getting exposed to that lead hopefully not eating it, right? But even if you have some, the plant with some uptake of lead, you got to remove that into a special waste facility. Don't put that plant in your compost. So <laughs> do you see the issues? Like it's mm -hmm. possible to do this. People have looked, done tons and tons of research. That complicated image that I shared is from a review paper on the potential for phyto extraction. Um, but the short answer is no. The short answer is there, there has not yet been a plant that is shown to help extract enough lead to fully remediate that soil. We don't have that. Um, we have some uptake, but it's not enough for remediation. So please be careful. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't plant these plants that can uptake some, right? That could potentially expose you and then you put it in your compost. Yeah. Cover that soil. Don't try to remove the lead. Got it. Um, and I think we may have answered this next question earlier too, um, but if there's anything you might want to add to the way this is phrased, um, how does the NYC Organics Collection suspension affect the Clean Soil Bank in terms of volume and cost? I mean, I think we've, you have addressed that primarily. Well, just to say that all these materials, again, when we talk about this stockpile that will be open from OER, it's all available for free. So these sediments, these sandy inorganic materials will be available for free. They're going to prioritize city projects and the community in East New York. But again, if you're a person that is looking for these materials, as I was saying, I, you're probably not going to be turned away, right? We want to make sure that people have access to clean materials to cap their sites or to grow in. Um, there may be a lack of organic matter for the short term. So it won't affect the cost, but will affect the productivity of the soils if you don't add organic matter. We have found we've done some studies with 0% compost growing just in the sands. You can get some growth. It's pretty encouraging actually, but not nearly as much as you get if you actually have organic matter. Right. Um, this next question is for Aishima. Um, uh, how many community gardens do you work with? Could you send us a list? I guess maybe I assume is, I imagine a list exists on the East New York Farm site. Um, no, we don't have a list online. We have our personal list, but we in East New York, I believe there's over 60 community gardens and we assist 40 plus each year. But yeah, whoever that person is, you could definitely email me. I could like write in the chat my email. Um, okay, next one is, question one is, how can a garden test its soil for lead? Are there kits for standard procedures published? 
And then a second part to that, our second part to that question, I guess, is how can an NYRP garden request clean soil, which seems like that might be a question for you, Jason. So first question is um, testing. As, uh, Pearl, I know we've talked about this a little bit. Yeah, I'm really happy to talk about this. Um, home testing kits are not the most effective things to use. So the best thing you can do is send your soil to a lab. Uh, as I was mentioning, the lab at Brooklyn College, if you Google Brooklyn College soil testing, you'll see the Urban Soils Lab at Brooklyn College, which has provided tests for over a decade. People have, that's where that map came from, which I showed at the beginning. People have sent their soils into the lab and they provided um, tests for $10 a sample. And what that does is use this um, machine called an XRF, an X-ray fluorescence instrument that shoots an X-ray at the sample and within 30 seconds or 90 seconds, you can get a reading back. Um, so that's not the kind of testing that you need if you're going to publish your paper to, well, we showed results in, in that paper, but like in a court of law, you need a really expensive test, which they also have the capability of, of doing there too. So they're currently closed, but plan to open up soon. Um, and in the meantime, there's another XRF that I've been using to bring to East New York Farms and provide testing there. So if you are in dire need in the short term of a soil test, please email me and I'll see to it that your soil can get tested with an XRF. Very generous, thank and you. The follow-up for um, requesting clean soil in an NYRP garden, um, I think that's a great idea. We'd like to see more of it being used. Um, we trialed our first um, clean soil uh, raised bed construction at Swindler Cove and this spring we planted it. So we're seeing our first garden with clean sediments. Um, and it's not in our standard uh, approach to, to building raised beds yet. Um, if there are gardeners working on an MRP, in an MRP garden that want to partner on this, I think um, that's something we can follow up on. It's a lot more work than how we normally build it at the moment because we don't have one of those cool sifters. Um, so there's a lot of sifting and mixing involved, um, but it, I, I think uh, I don't directly manage those gardens, but I think it's a conversation that um, we would definitely want to follow up on how we could see more clean soil in our garden. Yeah, sure. Um, the next question is, and I think maybe we've answered this in a roundabout way too, is uh, where do we go now for compost? Um, Aishima offered, but Anything, any other resources? Can I just say, I see um, at the bottom of the thread, an email from Queens Botanic Garden and Elsa Higby. If you all scroll down there, their Queens Botanic oh, yeah. is uh, looking to share some compost. Elsa's Excellent. Fantastic. So, oh, thank you for scrolling fun. down. <laughs> um, I'm trying to take them as they come, but that's great to know yeah. and very generous too. Yes. Um, if attendees are, if attendees to the webinar are not able to see it, I'm happy to copy and paste it um, to the chat when, once we get down there. Um, but thank you, Pearl, for pointing that out. Um, so it seems like that's a place, East New York Farms, as much as they're able. Um, I highly recommend home composting. I think putting the burden on all of us individuals is not the long-term solution, but for the short term, um, there are things you can do even in your home most people, from, a lot of people are familiar with worm bins. Um, I've had some of those, but I also just learned about another method where you can get cocoa peat from coconuts and some ash. And I'm about to start experimenting with that. Hmm. <laughs> I highly recommend home composting. Um, yeah, and don't forget BK Rot. Their main mission and their whole organization is about composting. And um, they have operational hours on their website bkrat.org and their compost is really great and amazing um you could definitely reach out to east new york farms and we will email you back i, I think there's a, a lot going on in the city as we try to recover from the loss of the compost project and all the fantastic people that do that work i think many of them will find ways to continue doing it um and MRP, I know we're, we're um, exploring different options for expanding our capacity to, to provide some composting in the short term. So I think uh, 
well, we'd like to see curbside pickup everywhere and, and, you know, a full return to the compost project. I think there's a lot of people trying to figure out how, how to best adapt to the new landscape and it's going to take a little while. Definitely. Yes, and if anyone has questions on here about, I, I know over social media and over email, I've received a lot of inquiries about composting in our spaces or the NYRP gardens or the parks that we oversee. Um, the most up-to-date information is um, at nyrp.org backslash COVID-19, which is kind of um, our most immediate response, but we are trying, um, we're not accepting any additional compost outside of our garden groups and our spaces for right now, but you know, just to reiterate what Jason just said, we're trying to work for alternatives since this is already proving to be a, a long-term issue. Um, so stay tuned. Um, all right, next question here. Can you describe source and nature of the sediment used at East New York Farms and other New York City urban farms community garden locations? So I love thinking and talking about this because, um, you know, for, for years I've, studied the geology of um, New York and our, and our you know, surrounding areas and the world. And what we know is that at the surface of Brooklyn and Queens and all of Long Island, there's a lot of sediments, broken down rocks that were left by glaciers. So I've been just roughly referring to them as glacially deposited sediments. There's many different types of glacially deposited sediments. Um, what we use, so a lot of sediments, broken down rocks left by glaciers, are what they call unsorted. And there's big boulders and all kinds of um, different sizes and shapes left in that pile. That's not what we use for this project. We found a lot of really nicely sorted sands. Um, that's generally what we're using. If there's a lot of clay, it's going to be harder to work with. So we've used mostly sand. It's been upwards of 90% sand. But recently I've been talking with a paleontologist who was saying, you know, are you sure that these sediments were left by glaciers or are they old seashore sediments? Are they the uh, sediments left by ancient seas? And we're about to start looking into that. And each site is going to be slightly different, but I do actually think a lot of these sediments have been so well sorted that they're not just from the runoff from the glaciers. They may actually have been ancient coastlines. Um, that are deep below the surface. So that's a very important <laughs> shift, you know, from the geologic perspective. From the growing perspective, you know, do they provide enough open pore space? Are they easy to mix? You know, do they help provide some structure for your soils? That's what growers want to see. But I love thinking about, oh, actually, what is the origin? So that's and, something to think too. And the, a really important part of this conversation for me is, is to compare them to what is available in the market. Yes. And it's really hard to find clean, good soil for building new gardens and new construction projects. There is a lot of old construction debris that's passed off as soil in the market. There's a yep. lot of pure organic material that's sold in garden centers as soil. And so it's not just that this is an important opportunity to reuse materials and mitigate lead, it's also addressing another problem we have, which is, it, I think, really a shortage of good soil. And so uh, the importance of this resource is, is um, hard to overstate, I think. And, and I, I think the applications go well beyond the urban agriculture we're talking about and capping contaminated soils. It, it has a lot of relevance for natural restoration, shoreline adaptation to climate change, really. Um, and a, as Pearl touched on, carbon sequestration. So. I think um, it's a wonderful resource in, in a lot of different ways. So I've talked about a lot of the follow-up study that we're gonna be doing with Cornell University. And we had plans to bring some sediments up to Ithaca to do some greenhouse studies um, over the past few months. Clearly there was a pause. Cornell University wants no one from New York City coming up there right now because of COVID-19. So that's on hold, but so what we've been we're also trying to design, um, hopefully, some studies to compare sands that are commercially available with the clean soil bank sediments. So that's what another thing I've been wanting to do is compare different forms of sediment side by side, not just changing the compost. Because right, each of these projects had a different source of sediments. Um, so yeah, more questions to be addressed. Yeah. Um, 
The next question we have, uh, I think, is one that I received over email or earlier and, and forwarded to you, Pearl, but um, we'll just answer it live here. Um, proposals have been made for stricter soil lead standards in New York State, i.e. to cut in half the current standard of 400 parts per million to 200 parts per million for residential zones and to 1,000 parts per million for areas zoned for commercial and industrial development. How do you think these revised, sta uh, revised standards would help in the future to diminish the problems you have described? So thank you for this question. Um, the, I think it would be great to have the soil standards lowered. I would like to see no areas with any elevated soil lead allowed to exist anywhere. Um, I want to see that from a public health perspective. Absolutely. We cannot let people be exposed to these risks. Um, when I've talked about this with people for many years from a logistical standpoint, a lot of the concerns are the repercussions of lowering these standards. Um, how, what is an organization or even a homeowner supposed to do to remediate the site if they're found to um, have soils in exceedance of these standards? And then you need to have some consequences put in place. And so while I believe in the covering and capping method, it's gonna be hard to adopt that from um, a legislative standpoint. We actually were pushing for bills to, to have this kind of language in them that you could cover. It all got dismissed. So there's a lot of efforts to work with um, the city council to push forward bills for testing, even lowering these standards and a lot of people don't want to deal with that. Again, the concern being that then you'd have to close the parks or you'd have to remove all that soil, which can be really disruptive and create more contamination issues. So there's a lot of issues here. Again, I mentioned Dr. Howard Milkey, who started this work looking at lead in soil in the late 1970s. Um, M-I-E-L-K-E, Howard Milkey. He's in New Orleans now. And he talks about these stories of... Um, community that was found to have high lead and there's a school and all of these amazing projects in the low income community in New Orleans. And when people realized there was high lead, they freaked out and they basically removed, they, they like had to excavate all of this soil. They disrupted the whole community and it never returned. And so Howard wants to see these standards lowered and yet he does not want to see people having to disrupt and create more issues in the process of dealing with soil lead. So it's a really tricky issue. And for me, either way, the thing we need to do is make sure that we have the solution ready to go. We need to make sure that you can have huge piles of clean soil ready to be put down when we find those elevated uh, areas with, with lead in them. So my, I think we can lower that standard. That would be great. But I think first and foremost, we need to make sure that we've got clean soil available. Um, and you can test or not test or have a lowered standard or not, either way, I wanna see an area covered. So I know that's a sort of a complex answer. Um, I hope I'm addressing it. Yeah, and if, if there is another, if there's a follow-up question to that, feel free as always to send um, it to info at NYRP or the email associated with this web webinar and we'll get it to Pearl. Um, Next question is actually, again, the mention of uh, compost at Queens Botanical Garden. Um, I dropped that information in the chat in, in the webinar. If anyone wants to check that out, um, let me know if you can't see it. Um, next up, if I wanted to have soil removed, who does that and where does it, in parentheses, probably go? Um, that is tricky. I've known a lot of people who've done it themselves and maybe exposing themselves in that process. Um, you know, there are contractors hired by the EPA for Superfund sites. Oftentimes it's developers who are now cleaning up brownfields. So I don't know if you call, like you don't, there's no like exterminator you call uh, who does this for the average person. Um, I don't know if you, Aishima or Jason are familiar with other people organizations or, you know, groups you can call? No, <laughs> remember, I also asked the same question, like, where does the soil get dumped? Yeah, I'm not. 
it gets taken to landfills, but um, right. And even if you, I've seen people just put out garbage bags of contaminated soil. It, it's a real problem. And it's why I think capping and covering it is so important as an option. Mm -hmm. And I think for large public projects, you can find reputable contractors to dispose of it and be relatively confident that it's going to be put in a landfill. But um, that's not an, an ideal solution. Um, it's very intensive as well as being expensive. Um, and, and I think for smaller scale projects, there's a lot of concern about that material being resold, reused, not adequately disposed of. Yeah, we hear horror stories about that. That, right, someone could just dump this material claiming it's clean. Um, so that has happened. So yeah. it's a tricky issue. And again, I, you know, just to cover it, people say, well, then you're just hiding it. You're not actually dealing with it. But for me, I think we need to pass on that information to future land users. Make sure we account for that history and then what's gone on and don't just dig below and stir it up in future years. So it's not about pretending it's not there, but it's about limiting exposure. Um, and it's the same thing we need to do with paint, that often with scraping and sanding, you're creating a bigger issue. If you have peeling lead paint, paint over it, keep, the, keep it covered. Mm, good point. Um, the next question actually is not lead related, so we'll do our best to answer it here on this, on this uh, webinar. But if vegetables have been sprayed with chemicals, will the resulting compost be too contaminated for growing food? This is a huge question. Pesticides, herbicides um, are often claimed to be safe. Uh, so there's a, it really depends on who you're asking here, which ones you're using, what's going on. I do really believe in the power of a high heat compost. I do believe that if your compost gets hot enough, um, a lot of these chemical compounds can be broken down. But again, I was talking about home composting. Uh, a lot of our home composts don't get very hot. Uh, warm and, absolutely don't. Yeah. I'm sure, I know Pearl's familiar with the results as well, but there was a study a number of years back by Cornell uh, on MRP's compost and a lot of compost that was made from food scraps in New York City, which likely includes a lot of non-organic produce. And the, the levels of persistent pesticides and pollutants were really low. So it was a really encouraging result. And it, it doesn't mean there's no risk, um, but it was very encouraging that, that compost with food scraps may not have significant pesticide problems. I don't know if that is fair or herbicide problems, if that's fair summary of the results for all. I think so. And there's a lot of information out there um, from the Cornell Waste Management Institute that yeah, has been tracking compost in the city for decades. Um, again, this is going to be a huge focus of our ongoing research, looking at all these different compost sources that have now been halted. Um, so everyone sort of has their own, you know, form of compost that they're making. But in general, I believe in that potential. Um, but right, that we can't ever say that there's no risks. But would, I think your work has a great perspective of thinking about how these chemicals and materials kind of cycle through our cities and, and spaces. And it, it certainly does, um, for me, make, it, it encourages the use of organic gardening and farming practices simply to the, the less we're putting out there that we know is getting cycled through our landscapes, the better. Right. So that this perspective of, uh, of looking at how nutrients and pollutants cycle through the city and the farm, I think, is very important and, and I think applies to a lot of pesticides that are persistent. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, but I think this is a huge, there's so many unknowns in the new chemical compounds. That's why lead is like the tip of the iceberg here, because there's also new compounds that are being synthesized all the time that we don't even have tests for. So just, I just think we should all be as aware as we can be and not fearful. You can't live inside a bubble. You just don't, right? Even especially in this time of the pandemic. Uh, I think it's becoming more and more clear. Uh, but I think we can push to keep making wiser choices, doing our best to limit exposures for everyone. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, the next question here is, are there any crops, and this is somewhat related, um, are there any crops that you can eat even if they are planted in questionable slash contaminated soil? So I think you part, partly answered that question, but. Yeah, but also always happy to reiterate that. So again, in general, what we see, especially let's talk about lead. Um, in general, there are some roots that can take up some amount of lead more than you'd want to consume. So carrots and radishes, I've seen some research indicating that potatoes can, can take up some lead in their cores. So you want to avoid roots. Um, then the next level of contamination we might see tend to be leafy greens. Now there's some dispute, are the leafy greens actually taking it up through the roots or is it splashing and landing on their surfaces? Either way, if you've got questionable contaminated soil, avoid roots, then do your best to avoid leafy greens. Um, but we see that fruit, especially tomatoes and peppers and fruits with smooth surfaces, tend to be the safest to consume. But as I also mentioned earlier, I've done some studies now and seen this in other work too, that you can have leafy greens. We did a study with lettuce grown in contaminated and clean soil side by side. And then we did different management treatments with mulching and a hoop house. And we found that when you mulch, even in contaminated soils, you can have crops that are safe for consumption. So I don't recommend it. I'm not telling you to grow food in contaminated soil. Do your best to avoid that. But if you have to, or you really don't know, aim for fruits and always mulch and always wash your veggies and fruits. I think that, that a lot of this work though should be seen as really encouraging for urban agriculture. Mm -hmm. I think a little knowledge goes a long way to figuring out how to produce food safely in the city. Yeah. And that's the, that's the thing, we, we have data now to support that this is a really important and viable practice. So there are these concerns, there's these potential risks, um, but, the, but the risks do not seem to outweigh the benefits by any stretch. And we keep seeing more and more data in support of that. Yeah. Is there anything you would want to add there, Aishima, to, to what they just said, based on what you've seen at East New York Farms? No, I think Pro cover everything. Cool. Well, sorry, we wouldn't want to tell people to do this if it wasn't safe. So now it's been looked at for <laughs> decades, right? There's all this data coming out and we're like, oh, it's, it's really safe. It's really okay. Do your best to be aware and proactive. And it, then it's fantastic. Mm. All right, so we've got uh, three more questions here that I'm going to try to cover. We are approaching our the 315 um, end here, but we're going to squeeze in these three questions. If there's anybody who has something they want answered quickly before we um, log off here, please go ahead and submit it. Um, but we'll definitely address these three questions here. Um, does the city alert its citizens about contaminated soil around the city, private, private and public sites? If it's a private site, is it up to real estate owners to do the te that testing slash amend the soil? Um. The city is not responsible for alerting citizens about soil issues. Um, lead in paint is it, there is um, there are laws around landlords needing to um, address that, but there are uh, different kinds of laws for your advert for lead in soil. Um, upon the sale of a building, there needs to be disclosure. Um, but in general, yeah, it's up to the individual owner to deal with this. And another reason why, for example, the Parks Department is concerned, they don't want to be liable for this, right? No one wants to be liable. No one wants people to be exposed. So it's a, it's a, it's a very delicate, sensitive topic for many people. Just encourage, yeah, if you are curious and want to test, you can get that. And then, yeah, it's unfortunately up to each of us to then be proactive. Mm. Um, next question here. I'm concerned about the use of gas and diesel powered leaf blowers in the city. I've noticed that they are used in Fort Tryon Park for one. In many cities, um, they are banned. Pertinent to lead in the soil, they also spew all sorts of contaminants in the air when they are used. There's not a question here, but I mean, I guess I get to the, some of the points you've made, right, Pearl, that there are plenty of different um, places where these contaminants enter the environment in New York City. Absolutely. I'm not sure about any effort to ban their use. Do you all, are you all aware of that here? I haven't heard it, but I think it's a good suggestion. I mean, we use them with great moderation in our landscape maintenance, um, but we're working actually currently in reviewing 
how we can eliminate their use in the park management and they are polluting and they are loud and thinking about dust as a source of contamination it is one more reason not to use a leaf blower. And so I think that's a great comment. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And if anyone learns about any efforts to ban <laughs> them with a lot of mobilizing going on right now, we'd love to know. Um, okay, here's our, our last question here. And I think this is, this is a really interesting one. Um, did it, sorry, please forgive me if you've already addressed this, but what kind of membrane would you suggest using to cover contaminated soil before putting clean soil on top of it? What is the best material to use? Plastic, is there recycled material available? Um, the, you want something that will allow water to drain through it. So an impermeable plastic, like plastic sheeting is not ideal. We, people talk about geotextile, geotextiles or landscape fabrics. They may be made of plastic, right? Many of them are quite synthetic, but they're porous so the water can drain through, um, but prevents mixing with the shovel. Really- We also, we use a geotextile fabric in our work for that. And I don't know of a more environmentally sustainable alternative, but mm -hmm. it's something definitely to look into. Mm -hmm. Again, the real issue is any mixing. If you have a thick enough layer that people won't be able to mix, that's fantastic. So again, getting a ton of these sediments, if you can raise the grade that much, I think would be, would be great, um, as long as you alert future land users to it. Before I got into this work, I had worked in some gardens and certainly Oh, what's this, what's this layer of fabric? I tore it up and mixed. So, <laughs> you know, I think it's, um, even, the, even that textile doesn't prevent people from, from doing that, that kind of thing. Sure. So I, I, I wish someone had told me that, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> many years ago. Ashima, what do you all use at East New York Farms? Do you know off the top of your head? We use landscape fabric, um, which works pretty well for us. That's, that's what we've been, suggestions to community gardeners like cover your beds or whatever area the contaminated area with landscape fabric um i know some folks like our landscape fabric is denser and thicker so it lasts a longer period and i know some community um, gardeners they buy the one at home depot that is not the best quality mm -hmm. um and i could probably share later on like where we get ours from yeah if anyone um has any questions, um, send those along and, and I can help connect you with Aishima or, or Pearl once more. Um, that's great. And thank you both for being so generous and Jason as well for offering these resources. Um, we did get, I went to acknowledge several comments or, or comments in the question section saying how grateful people are for this information, but um, happy to continue sharing and, and shoot us an email if you have any more questions. Um, Thank you all for your time. I know Aishima, this is a day off for you typically, so I really appreciate you hanging in there and, and dedicating your time to us. And, and Pearl, um, we look forward to staying in touch with your research. So um, thank you all. <laughs>